Shabbat Shalom and welcome. I'm Ross, and I am glad to be here with you today for a scriptural survey of a topic that I've called God's Great Nation. Before I get into the material today, please keep the people of Israel in your prayer, not only in the land of Israel, but Jews around the world. Jews around the world are currently being attacked verbally. They're being attacked in the media. Uh, and all I can think of this morning, aside from the material that I'm going to present, which is related, by the way, are the words that open Psalm 2. And growing up, I grew up with the King James Version. So in my mind, I obviously defer to that translation but just to read the first couple of words, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Most of you know the remainder of that psalm. We're going to talk more about that in the discussion following this class today. But as as late as yesterday, and even into today, there are councils around the world. Put aside what goes on in the United Nations, which is always against the people of Israel, uh, but in Saudi Arabia, nations have assembled to condemn Israel and to join together against the Jewish state. So keep the Jewish people in your prayer. Uh, marches are erupting around the globe and uh, they need to know, and uh, I think we need to know, who are friends, who are foes. Today I'm talking about God's great nation, God's great nation. And when I talk about God's great nation, as we will see, we're talking about the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, visibly known to the world as Jews. So we're going to talk today against God's goy gadol, if you prefer alliteration, as I do. God's goy gadol is a combining of English and Hebrew. The Hebrew phrase goy gadol is what I'll be focused on for this class today. Now, variations, various forms of goy gadol in various forms, it appears in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, 18 times. 18 times. I'm going to be focused on a particular set of those. I'll refer to the others. So the ones that I'm talking about today primarily, again, when we talk about God's goy gadol, we're talking about the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I would isolate of those 18, four or five of those that are very, very particular uh, very, very much a part of what I'm going to talk about. So in Genesis 12 too, now we're going to break down these passages more in depth. So I'm not going to go to these texts just yet. I'm just going to hit them at a very high level first. So uh, we're not reading the verse. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2, it says that I will make of you a great nation. God talking to Avram at the time. In chapter 18, verse 18 of Genesis, we read that Abraham shall surely be a goy gadol. In that particular passage, which we'll get into more in detail shortly, God is actually, we're looking in the mind of God, we're hearing the voice of God, though the text is relating it as God speaking to himself. Fascinating passage. In Genesis 46 and verse 3, we're talking about Jacob, and Jacob is referring back to a time that he was told, I will make you a goy gadol there. I will make you a great nation there. And then the there is talking about Egypt. We'll get into that as well. And then the fourth verse that I really want to focus on in more detail throughout the, the uh, class today is in Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 5. This particular passage is part of a, uh, a, a thing that is recited, a form of a recitation that's done to priest. It's an acknowledgement over the first fruits. In other words, when you go into the land, as the text would have us read, 
God will have you say this as you present your first fruits. And part of that is that God had indeed, it's a confession uh, and an acknowledgement that God had indeed by this time made Israel a goigado, a great nation. Now, before I get into the focus today on Israel as the identified great nation of God, I want to say that Ishmael, according to the biblical text, is also talked about using this language of goy gadol, a great nation. Uh, it, it were, were to read in Genesis 17, verse 20, Genesis 21, verse 3, and verse 18, all let us know that Ishmael is also to be a great nation, and that's because he is Abraham's seed. So when we talk about that, we'll get into that uh, more in a later class. But just to, to have it on record and to have it in your notes, it's not just the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who are referred to as a great nation. But what I'm going to begin to show in this class today is that of all the great nations, Israel, Israel is to be God's great nation with a very specific task, a task that is not given to other nations referred to as great. So we have to then define what exactly does great mean. So as I covered in a previous class, who does Israel belong to? For instance, we recognize and we distinguish between the children of Abraham. Abraham's descendant through Isaac and Jacob, they are to receive a covenant and a specific piece of land. Other descendants of Abraham, uh, Ishmael, is not to receive that land, but is to receive another land. He too will be great, but he won't receive the covenant. He won't receive the land according to the biblical text. Now, when I talk about also while I'm on the subject of different lands belonging to different groups, I should also point out that it's very clear in the biblical text that Esau also receives different lands, Esau, also known as Edom. Now, I know I've seen comments that have come to me in, in uh, messages and emails and comments on YouTube videos where they say, did you not know that Esau and Edom is the Christian? I'm not entertaining uh, just these wild interpretations that come in much later. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about historical textual, who are we talking about in the text? Not something crazy like these uh, would have us believe. So uh, Ishmael gets different lands. They too will be a great nation, but I'm talking today about God's great nation. Now, I will say this as well. There's one other that I should point out that uh, a person that we know biblically that's associated with the phrase goy gadol, and that is Moses. Interestingly enough, in two texts in the Pentateuch, when God's anger is raised against the children of Israel, God threatens, according to two priestly texts in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 10, and the book of Numbers chapter 14 and verse 12, God actually tells Moses, I'm going to wipe this group out and I'm going to start over, and I'm going to make you, Moses, into a great nation. But that doesn't happen. Moses intercedes on behalf of the people. The original plan stood. The original plan, by the way, still stands to this day. Now, there are other, there are other nations treated in the plural among the 18 texts in the Hebrew Bible where it talks about uh, goyim, nations, uh, gadolim, great nations, where it refers to other nations as being great nations. But almost without exception, I, I think I can say without exception, but all of the other occurrences in my notes for certain that I went through this week in preparing this class all of these that are referred to as great nations 
are other than Israel, and they're great for other reasons, okay? They're great for other reasons, and you can do a search for that. I have eight passages in the Tanakh which refer to great nations in the plural, uh, which are other than Israel, and they're great for reasons other than which the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are called God's great nation. <clears throat> there is there is a distinction. There is a distinction to be made, and I'll point this out, between Avram, Avraham, Jacob, Israel, the people as God's great nation and other great nations that are not the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible, the biblical texts clearly tell us what that difference is. So the great nation, God's great nation, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's descendants is going to be set apart, going to be distinguished from what we read about the other uh, great nations. In this teaching, in this class, a survey of the text related to God's great nation or God's goy gadol, I want to primarily understand the meaning of great in this context. Where, where we read goy gadol, the Hebrew goy is nation, people. Gadol is generally big, great so what does it mean? We're gonna, I want to really understand that term. What does it mean to be God's great nation? And I want to distinguish between what does it mean? Is it different? Is it to be understood differently? We talk about God's great nation and these other nations that are also referred to as great nations. What is to set Israel apart? <clears throat> What is to set Israel apart? All right. Before Abraham was, before Abraham was, things were different. Things were different before Abraham. That is to say that after Abraham, or Avram, as he is initially introduced to us in the biblical text, uh, before him, things were different. And things become different after Abraham. Before Abraham, we do get uh, something quite interesting. I want you to go with me this morning to the book of Genesis chapter 5. We're going to read Genesis chapter 5 and verse 22, beginning in verse 22. Genesis 5, beginning in verse 22. And it says, And Enoch walked with God. After he begat Methuselah 300 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. We get with Enoch a, an interesting phrase. Enoch, it says, walked, walked about with God. He has a relationship, is what the text seems to suggest, that sets him apart. In fact, if you read in Genesis chapter 5, over and over, the names of the various people that are listed in there, brief summaries of their life. This one lived so many years. He begat sons and daughters. He died and so forth. You get to Enoch and something's different. Now, because of that, there are a lot of legends that developed. Uh, Enoch is taken to heaven, and we have a book of Enoch, and mystics from time, uh, ancient times to modern, have loved the story of Enoch for what it says and for what, quite honestly, it doesn't say. But we have this idea, though, and the thing that really should stand out, regardless of what happens to Enoch, uh, if, if we could know, what we do know is that he walked with God. He has a relationship with God. And that walked with God, that phrase occurs twice when we read about Enoch. But uh, we, don't, we don't read uh, beyond that about too many other people. But I do want you to look at Genesis 6, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Genesis 6 and verse 9. And this is after describing the depraved state of the human race, basically, at this point. 
And in verse 9, it begins after the white space, and it says, Ele toledot noach. These are the generations or the begettings, the bringings forth of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect or complete in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah walked with God. This Right before this, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah, even in the midst of a very bad and wicked generation, which we read about uh, in the book of Genesis. It's quite, it's quite stirring. It tells us that God even regrets that he had made man. But when we read this about Noah, we read also that he, like Enoch, walked with God. There's a relationship there. He finds grace in the eyes of God. He, walk, he is just and upright in his generation. Now, some people have suggested that uh, if you look at it on a scale, like, you know, compared to the people of his day, he was righteous, but he wasn't really righteous. That's not what this text implies. This text implies that Noah, unlike others in his generation, uh, had a relationship with God. And that relationship with God is why God chose him to continue humanity through. All right. Now, so we have a couple of examples. God creates Adam. He, he seeks and hopes that, that man would be in his image and that man would achieve the great things for which man is capable of achieving. We get very few glimpses. Enoch walks with God. Noah walks with God. We start over at Noah. But ultimately, ultimately, the plan seems to be headed in the wrong direction again. But go with me to Genesis 17, Genesis 17, uh, verse 1. And this is what I meant to uh, suggest when I said that prior to Abraham, things are different. But after Abraham, things change. Now watch this. In Genesis 17, when Avram was 90 years old and nine, Jehovah appeared to Avram and said to him, I am Ani El Shaddai, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. Walk before me and be Tamim. This is the same, it's describing the same walk as was uh, exemplified in the lives of Enoch and Noah. So it, it's not different yet, but stay with me. So the idea is that Avram is called to the same relationship that was uh, described in the text belonging to Enoch as well as Noah. Now, this particular story, though, in Genesis 17, is presented as occurring 24 years after Avram's call. So it's been almost a quarter of a century since God originally called Avram. So we're going to go back and we're going to begin to look at the call of Avram and what exactly is it. Yes, in Genesis 17, it says that uh, God expects Avram to walk in, uh, in accordance with this path blazed by people like Enoch and Noah, but there's something more about the call of Avram. I want to go to the first time we meet Avram, and that is Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, beginning in verse 31. Genesis 11, 31. This is where we meet. This is where we meet um, Avram. It says, And Terach took Avram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Avram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. Uh, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So we meet Avram, and it says that his, uh, he, he leaves with uh, Terah and other family members, <clears throat> and they go from uh, Haran. And 
what is interesting, or, or they go from Ur of the Chaldees, and they, they settle in Haran. Now, what we read later in the biblical text, we're not going to read this now, uh, but in the book of Joshua, it describes this family, unlike what tradition says that Avram was this uh, monotheist who rebelled against his father's idol working shop and destroyed idols. None of that's historical. None of that's in the biblical text. The Bible tells us that Avram uh, and his family were idolaters, and ultimately they were serving other gods on the other side of the river. And so ultimately, God calls this family out of that, and this is where we're going to pick up today. I want to look at Genesis chapter 12 now, verse 1. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. And it says this, Now, the Lord said unto Avram, in Hebrew, lech lecha, lech lecha, which means walk for yourself, very literally, walk for yourself. It's translated, get thee out, King James of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show thee, and I will make of you, I will make of you a goy gadol, a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless you, curse him that curses you, and in you... Abraham, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, this is the call of Avram. We don't know what led to the departure mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. In fact, uh, most scholars would say, if you study these side by side very closely, they don't fit together. They're two different sources. Uh, but be that as it may, according to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God calls Avram out of his country, uh, country uh, from his kindred and his father's house, which if we read other texts in the Bible, seems to be the place called Ur of the Chaldees, which is a phrase that's mentioned five times in the Hebrew Bible. So, But it's not chronological because 11 already has him out of the land of his birthing, if you follow what I'm, what I'm saying there. But nonetheless... It's the call that I want to focus on. He says very, very clearly that, that he is to leave everything with which he is familiar and go sight unseen to a land that he'll show him. He's to leave his land, his father's house, everything that he knows, and he hasn't seen this place that God calls him to go to, but he is to go, and he does. Now listen, the... What's he going to get for going to this unseen land? He's going to get the blessings that, he, that are described here. Seven points. He's going to make Avram, who has no children at this point, and he's old. He's 75, all right? All my 75-year-old friends, and I have a lot. That I don't mean you're old. Uh, he is older than most people are when they have children. Can I say it that way? He's going to make of you a great nation. He's going to bless Avram. He's going to make Avram's name great. Avram will be a blessing. And then this is interesting because it's very relevant. All of this is relevant. This is very relevant for today, and it's why there is a line drawn in the sand. Whose side will you be on? It says, God will bless those who bless Avram and curse those uh, who esteem Avram lightly. And then the part that I will ultimately get to is that in Avram, not only is this all about blessing Avram and Avram's going to be blessed, but somehow through this goy gadol, through this great nation, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. So when the call comes forward, the call is lech lecha, walk for yourself. And it says that he does walk. He does walk uh, because right after verse three, when we get into verse four, it says, and Avram walked and he followed God's ways. 
Now I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to follow what happens with Abram. Uh, 18, Genesis 18, verse 18 and 19. Now, right before this story here, God is going, the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah has reached him. He's come down to investigate and, uh, and is con contemplating destroying these two wicked neighbors. And it says uh, he's, he's asking, God is asking himself, should he hide, verse 17, the Lord said, shall I hide from Ab Abraham the thing which I do? Now here's the answer, verse 18 and 19. <clears throat> Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of Jehovah to do justice in, and righteousness that Jehovah may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. In other words, everything that we read in Genesis chapter 12, everything we read in Genesis chapter 12 that is going to come to pass because God promised it to Avram uh, and to his descendants, it hinges on, it hinges and is connected to the blessings that ultimately go to the nations because God says that he's got to let Avram, Abraham, in on his plan because Abraham is going to become that great nation he's promised, and he's going to he's going to guarantee that Abraham is going to guarantee it because he's going to pass that on to his children and to his household, which extends beyond a a physical uh, descent. Those who attach themselves to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some of you who are listening to my my talk today. Maybe not uh, be part of Abraham's seed, literally, but you could be part of that household, and we're going to talk later about that in more detail. So Avram, later Abraham, ultimately this becoming a great nation is connected to the, the spreading of justice and righteousness, which is called the way of Jehovah. So that's what this is all about. Now, I want you to go with me to Genesis chapter 46, beginning in verse 2. Genesis chapter 46 and verse 2. And God spoke unto Israel uh, in the visions of the night and said, Yaakov, Yaakov, and he said, Hineni, here am I. Verse 3, and he said, Ani, I am, or Anoki, Anoki, I am the El Elohe Avicha. I am the God, the God of your father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of you a goy gadol. A goy the message to Jacob from God, don't be afraid. You're going into exile, and it is in exile in Egypt that God says, I will make of you a goy gadol. Now, uh, look, let's go to Deuteronomy 26, because in Deuteronomy 26, beginning in verse 5, this confirms that the making of the great nation in Egypt, uh, it, it confirms it right here, verse 5. And you shall speak, this, by the way, is that confession, that acknowledgement that uh, the children of Israel will make once they're in the land of promise. They're going to make this confession, and here it is, verse 5. You shall speak and say before Jehovah your God, a Syrian... Various translations read differently. Um, ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, became there a nation great, mighty, and populous. In Hebrew, goy gadol. 
Um, and the Egyptians evil entreated us and afflicted us and laid upon us hard bondage. When we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice, looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he's brought us into this place and he's given us this land, even a land that flows with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Jehovah, see, they're, they're basically praying as they bring this forward, uh, which you, O Jehovah, has given me. And you shall set it before Jehovah your God and worship before Jehovah your God, and you shall rejoice in every good thing which Jehovah your God has given you, and unto your house, you and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. So God tells Abraham he's going to make him a great nation. He affirms that to him uh, in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 18. Uh, as we work through the text, uh, as you work through in Genesis chapter 46, Jacob knows that he will be part of forging this great nation, of building this great nation, has something to do with what God tells Jacob has something to do uh, with going into Egypt. And so now the question becomes, what does gadol mean? If he's going to make Israel into a goy gadol, a great nation, the question is, what does that mean? Does it mean, as often seems to be the case in other contexts about other great nations, has to do with the enormity of that nation, the great size of that nation? Well, that doesn't seem to be what is implied by the term gadol when we talk about goy gadol as it is applied in those texts dealing with Israel. Go with me to Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, beginning in verse 7, Deuteronomy 7, 7. It says, The Lord, Jehovah, did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all the people. But because Jehovah loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Know, therefore, uh, that Jehovah, your God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with him that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. It repays them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command you this day to do them. Now, in this particular passage, uh, Goy Gadol appears a couple of times. And the, the thing that we need to understand is that it's not because of the size of this group. It's because of the promise that God made to the fathers. He set his love on them. Uh, and they're to be great, but it seems that in context, the greatness is because of the one who has called them, and uh, it's based on their adherence to God's laws. It's not because of their own virtue, as we read in Deuteronomy 9. Deuteronomy sets all of this straight, uh, but the idea, at least in Deuteronomy 7, is that Gadol doesn't mean large in size. It has something to do, it has something to do with a subject which makes most of my Israeli, most of my Jewish friends very uncomfortable. It has to do with an idea uh, associated with God's love and favor and God's choice and a covenant, an agreement that goes back all the way 
to patriarchal times. It seems to have to do with their adoption, their acceptance of a way of life, but the way of life is not their way. There is a way that seems right to man, we read in Scripture, but that, that way leads to destruction. This way is the way that we read about. Uh, let's look one more time at Genesis 18, beginning in verse 18. Let's, let's make sure we understand what way it is that they are to model. Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, a goy gadol v'atzum, a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, because I know him. He will command his children and his household after him, and they will keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. You see, the idea is defined here very clearly, no ambiguity, the way of God that, that God knows Avram and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will pass down to their descendants and the household after them is to model the way of God, which is very clearly described here as doing justice and righteousness in the earth. This, the modeling of this way, will ultimately lead to bringing about the next phase. It, somehow, Israel and the household is going to keep the way of the Lord, but how does that spread to the nations? H how is it that blessing through Abraham ultimately reaches the nations of the earth. How does that happen? Well, I think I have a clue in the text. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Deuteronomy 4 and 5. We'll begin there. This is Moses speaking according to the text. Behold, I have taught you, talking about children of Israel, uh, statutes and judgments even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, or as I would like to translate, guard therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. In other words, if you behave like the other nations, there's no problem. Uh, there are problems, but not with the neighbors. The, the problems are with God if you don't behave. But, but it, this is, you need to, to model the way of God because people will begin to look and take note. Here's what they'll say. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this nation, this great nation, this goy gadol, is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there that's so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? And then the warnings come about don't, don't forget, don't, don't slip. But the idea, the thing that I want to suggest is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel are told, God says, I'm going to make you a great nation. And, and then the final stanza of that promissory song is that ultimately all the nations of the earth will be blessed in Abram, okay? But how, how, how does it go from Remember, I, I tell you, before Abraham, it was sort of an isolation, uh, an individual thing. You have, uh, you, you know, he, he thinks that Noah might be because Noah's a righteous person. And then, you know, but you have Enoch. You have these people that walk with God. Now, once Abram comes, he and his household, Abraham, 
The call is to a people to follow a certain walk, not just an individual to walk with God, but an entire nation, and to model that walk on the world stage such that other people say, there's not another wise nation like this. Now, the idea is that ultimately nations will, uh, will, will take note of this. In the beginning, in the beginning, God, when God called Avram and first began to convey the idea of a Goy Gadol, he said in Avram, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And there are four passages where that refrain is repeated, um, and I want you to see those. Look on the screen. Genesis 12, 3 is the first, and I'm going to go through these quickly. Just going to read these verses uh, apart. Genesis 12, 3. I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curses you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Some translations say, and, and through you or in you, all nations of the earth. That phrase is there. All the nations of the earth will bless themselves in you. Now, how is that? You see, it's a connecting piece. It, the one it, that's called a great nation will bring benefit to the other nations. You're going to be a blessing, Abraham. You're going to be a blessing, Jacob. You're going to be a blessing, uh, Israel. And you're going to bless others. The others being the nations of the world, some of those also could be called great nations, but not great in the sense that I'm talking to you as God's great nation. You, Goy Gadol, you will model God's way, and because of that, blessing will come to the other nations of the world. Next verse, chapter 18, verse 18. Just want to pick up the promise dealing with other nations. 18, 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, goy gadol va'atzum, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Hmm. Next one, chapter 22, Genesis 22 and verse 18. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. See, Abraham obeyed the voice of God. He followed his statutes, his judgments, his Torah. Uh, read Genesis chapter 26, where that message is conveyed to Isaac. He said, the reason this plan is passing on to you is because daddy was faithful. Now, Again, one more verse. Look at chapter 20. Well, look at that. I had it in my notes. See there? I, I love it when a plan comes together. Verse 4, uh, 26, 4. And I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto your seed all these lands, these countries, and in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Verse 5. Why? Because... Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. You see, God told Avram, you will be a goy gadol. Before he had the first child. Before he even had an adopted child, he told him that. And he was 70 uh, five years old when he gave him this message that he would become a, uh, a great nation. And he knew, he just knew that Abraham would pass that on to his seed and a broader household. Others would be gathered to him besides those that were gathered outside of Israel. Friends, it, Abraham is called a friend of God, and, and, and others are friends of God who are also friends of Abraham. I like to think of myself as a friend of Abraham too, and a friend of God as well, because outside of the family even, there are those who attach themselves to that great nation 
and the task with which it was given. God chose Abraham and his seed to be a Goy Gadol. It would be this great nation would be forged in the fire of an iron furnace in Egypt, where ultimately the kingdom of Israel, the house of Israel, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would undergo great hardship and would be abused and mistreated, enslaved. But God would save that family out of that furnace. But what sets this great nation apart from the other great nations is that covenant, the laws that God gave the Goy Gadol, the great nation of God, were given laws and a way of justice and righteousness to model to all the other nations. And Israel was to be a blessing. The part that many in the world no longer understand, but mark it down, they will, is that those who bless this great nation, who stand with this great nation, who's not perfect, but seeking to model a just and right way to be a light in darkness, those that stand with that nation will also be blessed. But listen to me, those that esteem it lightly, those that curse Israel will also be cursed. And you say, well, wait a minute, it says Abraham. Well, I'm going to tell you, look at Genesis 27, uh, 29 and Numbers chapter 24 and verse 9, because that also, the idea that those who uh, bless Israel will be blessed, those that curse will be cursed. Uh, Numbers chapter 24, 9 and Genesis 27, 29 associate that Abrahamic promise with Jacob, with Israel. All nations, all nations ultimately will find blessing through God's Goy Gadol, through God's great nation, which is Israel. And that status, some might say, well, that, that's ancient, Ross. That's over. Let me tell you, that status is not over. It's not been revoked. The promise of God and, and the claim to the promise of God's goy gadol and, and what ultimately leads to the blessing of the nation, yes, Israel, the Israel of today, needs to do everything they can to adopt that way and to model that way because ultimately it's their return to God. And, and believe me, that is happening on a very massive scale, uh, will ultimately lead to blessings around the world. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning uh, in verse 1. I want to show you the connection between Israel's behavior and the blessing that we're talking about to the nations. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 1 says, If you will return, O Israel, says Jehovah, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not remove, and you shall swear, Jehovah lives, Jehovah Chai, in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness, then the nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him shall they glory. Goes on to talk about in Jeremiah, beautiful chapter. In Jeremiah chapter 4, it goes on to talk about uh, breaking up the fallow ground and not sowing among thorns. Seems like I heard an ancient parable about that one time. It's quite interesting. Circumcise yourself 
to the Lord, it says in verse 4, take away the foreskins of your heart, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. So Israel does have a task. There is a sense in which Israel becoming the God's great nation has great responsibility attached there too. We've not seen the fullness because what ultimately needs to happen to take place before our eyes, one day all the nations will look and say, what a wise and understanding people that is and will ultimately lead to blessings all over the world. But I can tell you this, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the ones that God refers to as his great nation, as his goy gadol. It might be uncomfortable for some, but I can tell you this, according to the Bible, this group, this physical group, this is not something that can be spiritualized and uh, re- another group replaces the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, this coming week, Jonah and I are going to be talking about replacement theology in various forms and the evils of taking from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that which God gave them. Let me tell you, God has selected, has chosen this people, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to be a chosen nation and a holy nation. And I'm going to talk about a holy nation, but I'm going to do that next week. Don't miss it. Join me Saturday, 10.30 a.m. Central Time. Pray for Israel If you're with me live this morning, I want you to meet me in the Discord server for a discussion, Uh, and you got just a little bit of time to get there. I hope to see you there. Shabbat Shalom, Shavuotov.